Good morning. A couple of things before we begin today. Uh, Dale has brought us flowers again. You know the drill on that. Make sure that you, uh, if you want one, you're going to have to elbow your way to the front. No, don't do that. <laughs> Come and have some flowers and take them home and enjoy them. Uh, there are also some uh, leftover, not leftover, some surplus cucumbers uh, that are in the foyer there. I believe there's a few still. Uh, Gail Garwick had those on her plant. She's like, I am done with cucumbers. So by all means, if you would like one, take those. Uh, she said she's not making pickles. Um, that is uh, kind of where we're at in the season. The, the produce is starting to come on and we are blessed to be enjoying the bounty. Um, also want to remind folks that we are having, going back into our family fellowship cycle, we're having a game night uh, this coming Saturday, Wednesday, the 31st, the last day of the month. So uh, you're welcome to come and enjoy a meal and a time together, uh, just good, solid fellowship with your sisters and brothers. Speaking of sisters and brothers, I have my book today, which means that I, we're going to invite somebody to join us in membership here. Uh, I asked Sandy uh, whether she would prefer Sandy or Sandra, but I'm going to say Sandy, uh, Bennett, to come forward. And she says, hey, whenever you want to do this, and I'm like going, it's not up to me. It's whenever you want to do it. So if you want to come forward, we'll do this. Do you want to wait? All right, come on then. We got some people who've been talking about membership and they're like, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? And they were like going, whenever you would like. So uh, can we share your news? Okay, uh, Bob and Wanda got married yesterday. So they've been such a part of each other's life for so long and it's just wonderful that you were able to do that and we want to celebrate with you. Uh, come on over, come on over here. It is a good way to celebrate, so. <laughs> I, I hope we don't, it doesn't feel like we're, we're strong-arming anybody here. They, they talk to me about this, and so that's, that's what we did. So you've witnessed this before. You know how this happens in churches. We ask a few questions about your relationship with Jesus. That's what's important to us, and so that's what we're going to focus on on this. Um, so I'll ask, I'll read the question. You can respond in the affirmative if you agree with it. And then we as a congregation, I will speak on your behalf and I invite you to share uh, with an affirmation at the end. So, friends in Christ, you have previously made a confession of your faith and have been members of his church. We rejoice in your decision to become members of this congregation in full covenant relationship with the believers who worship and serve God in this place. Do you now reaffirm your faith in and loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his gospel? Yes. Yes. Good. As you unite with this church, will you worship and serve and share in its programs, supporting it with your earnest prayers, regular attendance, loyal service, and faithful stewardship as God gives you strength? Yes. Good. Do you promise to live and share with us in the bonds of Christian fellowship? giving and receiving Christian love, sharing and bearing one another's joy and pain. Yes. Good. So, this is our part. I'll say this on your behalf. We welcome you with joy and affection into this household of faith. We pledge you, our help, our prayers, our concern, that we may all increase in the knowledge and the love of God. We trust God for strength to follow with you in Christ's way, keeping together the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. Amen. So if all God's people agree with that, I invite you all to say amen. Amen. We're here with you. So, the members of this church bid you welcome in God's name. On their behalf, I'm going to give each of you a hug. I hope that's all right. They say right hand of fellowship, but I, I don't know. That just seems too formal for us. I don't know, wipe it on my pants. So on their behalf, I will give you the, the, the embrace of fellowship. And we pray that all of us together, united in Christian love, may grow in all Christian graces and in service to our Lord. Wanda, welcome. Thank you. Bob, welcome. Sandy. Welcome. Thank you so much. And you'll probably get a little of that from them too later. But uh, oh, it's good to be with you. And it, we, we, they're part of our family now. They're officially part of our family. So, yes. All right. Very Thank you. Thank you. 
Ah, let's begin our service. Although that feels like a pretty good beginning right there. So, yes, sir. Yeah, come on up. You can do it right there. <laughs> You're welcome today. To follow. Good morning. I welcome everyone here. And if you're visiting, I hope you feel like this is your home today. And uh, I hope you feel welcome. Um, I can't say the other part. My wife said I can't say. If you don't feel welcome, hit somebody. But I can't say that. Okay. Um, our reading today is John uh, 3, verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees and named Nicodemus. First John. First John. Do you? Do you? Okay. I got John. Where is first John? What? First John. Isn't that it? Get up here. First John. Three. Not. Not. You got to go back here. He knows where it is. Ah, oh, there it is. Oh, first John. Okay, okay. You know, and I rehearsed this too. Yeah. Okay, first John, not the other John. Okay, three, one, and two. How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not appear, oh, wait a minute. The reason the world does not know us that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, it's never too late to be corrected. And, and I think this goes for our spiritual life. We go along and, you know, sometimes we need a slap in the head and go, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe you need a little correction. But how many of you pay attention to bumper stickers? You go down the road, yeah. Yeah, they're kind of nice. See these little stick people, you know, father and mother, kids and dog and a cat. Then you see the other guy that says, my dog eats stick people. You know, and you're going like, ah. But, you know, uh, all kinds of bumper stickers. My wife and I are driving along, and there's one down on the right-hand corner of the bumper. We couldn't quite make it out, so we got up there closer, and the bumper sticker said this, do you follow Jesus as close as you're following me? <laughs> you know, and, and I, okay. You know, but sometimes you see one that just kind of sticks with you. And that was one of them. So let's bow our heads. Dear God, we come before you today knowing that we are all sinners in your eyes. We hope and we pray for your forgiveness 
and thank you every day. Amen. One other thing, Wanda and I have a history. Goes back, what, 60 years, Wanda? Yeah, and my brother too. Yeah. When you go to the fair and you get a party pup, not just corn dog, party pups, you wonder how the stick gets in the hot dog? One wiener, one stick at a time, and that's what you do for three or four hours before the fair opens. Good morning. Please stand. without John's help, I think. But, you know, 
God works in mysterious ways. I was up in Seattle uh, visiting my sister and uh, staying in a hotel, and uh, the hotel restaurant doesn't open till like, I think, 8 o'clock or something. And I'm thinking, oh man, that's not right. So outside in the street about 3 in the morning, I hear these loud, I mean, these guys are getting into it. So I run, stumble, fall over the chair. I get to the window, and I'm looking out there, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this is going to be great. And I look, and there's IHOP, 24 hours open. And I go, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when we're looking for an answer, we just have to look for God, and God will send us what we need, not what we want. But in this case, it worked out. So as I'm eating breakfast, I couldn't eat all of it. And I'm thinking, man, it's kind of a shame to waste. And I look outside, and there's a homeless guy out there. And I'm thinking, hmm. So I had it boxed up because I think God was saying, I did you a favor. Now what are you going to do? So I boxed it up, walked outside, and I said, knock yourself out. And uh, I don't know. You know, God just works in mysterious ways, and we got to follow what he tells us, not what we want to do, but what God tells us to do. May we bow our heads. Dear God, we give to you just a portion of what you do for us. And sometimes we turn a blind eye because we ask for more. We want more, not what we need. So may we always look to you and say, God, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dave. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Who's that? Does the Teddy have a name? Just Teddy? What is it? Is it Teddy? Okay, we'll go with that. That's cool. All right, so you know what we've been talking about recently? About the, what God is like, right? You got it, Megan. Absolutely. So we talked about God is like the wind, right? We talked about how God is like a vine that we have to be attached to if we want to be healthy, not like this branch. We talked about God like a rock, a place of shelter and security. We talked about God. Do you remember this one? It's a chicken feather. So God is like a mother hen who wants to shelter her brood underneath her, his wings. We talked about God being like a potter. And this is the pot that I made that's not very good, but God makes you guys just exactly how you're supposed to be. We talked about God being like a father. I don't have a father right here, but I guess I'm a father, so you can maybe think of it that way. But God's the perfect father. And human fathers sometimes make mistakes, but God doesn't make any mistakes. I got one more for you today. What's this? It's a water bottle. What's in it? Water. Exactly, water. The Bible talks about God being like water. Did you know that the people that, that, uh, of Israel that uh, the Bible was written to originally, you know that they lived in a very dry, deserty place? And sometimes they would wander through it and they were moving their sheep from one place to the next and they didn't know where their water was going to come from. 
if you were farming in that region and growing wheat or something else, you had to depend on the rain that would come. And sometimes it went a long time. Have you guys noticed that recently around here? We're kind of the same here. It's super dry here, especially right now. When was the last time it rained? Do you guys remember? Like a week ago, yes. And it was, oh, nice. It rained a little bit. But then what happened? It got hot again and dry again. And this is what it's like when you live in a dry place like we do. Do you guys like water? Yeah. Water's pretty awesome, huh? You guys go swimming? I'm going to go, you're going swimming today? Nice. Are you going to go with them? You're going to go too? Nice. Swimming's pretty cool. That's nice. Do you like to drink water? How long do you think you can go without water? Take a guess. Well, you can go longer than a few hours. That's a good guess. Three days or so. And then you die. You got to have water, a lot of water. Where do you guys get your water in juice, right? Well, juice is pretty good. Bottle of water. Oh. Okay. Sometimes that happens. So we got to remember to drink water. The Bible talks about God being like water for people that really, really need water. So God gives us life and God sustains us and makes us healthy. And the Bible talks about the Spirit of God being like water being poured out. Jesus uses the example of being living water when he talked to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And so you can think of God being like water that you really, really need when you're really, really thirsty. It's kind of nice to get water, a drink of water when you're thirsty, isn't it? And we need God like that. So that's another way to think about God. Make sense? Good. All right. You guys are getting a really full picture here, aren't you? That's what we want. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are all these many different things to us. That you are like the wind and rocks and like a hand that wants to protect us. You're like a true vine. You're like water when we are so thirsty that nothing else will, will help us but water. And we know that you were there for us to sustain us and give us life. We're just grateful for all these different pictures that you share with us that help us understand you better. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go. Stand again, we'll sing God of grace and God of glory. Thank <laughs> you.
that does happen on occasion where we go in a direction that we didn't anticipate going. It's perfectly fine, but I needed to read that first John passage. I would have just let him read the, the John passage. That's a great one too, and, and it'll be fine. But I really wanted us to kind of have this idea of love in our heads. That first verse of that third chapter of his letter is so amazing. It's just, I'm overwhelmed by it. He says, see what love the Father has for us that we should be called the children of God. See what love God has for us that we would be called the children of God. Wow. Wow. This letter is full of hits. So we're going to go to chapter 4 for our text for the message today. Beginning in the seventh verse, John writes to his beloved, the people that he cared so much about, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God has loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Jesus was a popular figure during his ministry. There were so many people that came to Jesus and wanted to listen to him and, and to hear what he had to say. They'd come out in crowds. Great, great multitudes of people would want to, want to hear him and see him. Often they were hoping to see some miracle or some wonder as well. Now, one of the reasons that Jesus was so popular was that he was kind of different than the rest of the religious establishment. He wasn't too judgy. He wasn't the kind of person that would look down his nose at, at somebody if they weren't, you know, that popular or that, that uh, clean, if you will. Not like the other religious figures of his day, the Pharisees and the temple leaders. It's why Luke tells us in the 15th chapter of his gospel that there were tax collectors and sinners and that type of people who were coming near to listen to Jesus. Jesus represented hope to them, and a kind of embrace that they had never felt before. But that same embrace that Jesus was sharing with them, it made the religious leaders mad. They didn't like it. How dare he? How dare he, they asked themselves. How dare he reach out to these people, people that we've already decided aren't worth reaching out to? So Jesus has a response to this. In that chapter in Luke's account, Jesus tells a story. Well, he really tells several stories there, a few. One is about a shepherd who leaves his 99 sheep on the hillside to go and find that one that is lost. Another story is about a woman who lights a lamp and sweeps out her entire house in order to find that single coin out of 10 that was missing. And then... The best known story, the one that I hope we're all familiar with, it's not about lost sheep or lost coins, but about lost sons. Consider this third story, the last in this cycle of stories. In the story, there's a man who has two sons. And the younger son, for some reason, the text doesn't tell us, but for some reason, he's decided that living under his father's authority in his father's household, it's not something that he wants to do anymore. And so he insists that his father give him the inheritance that he has coming. And the father, again, for some unknown reason, agrees. And the son takes the money and he heads out into the world, not to make good, but to waste everything that he was given. He squanders it all in dissolute living. That's the way that Luke puts it. 
He falls from the very greatest heights, the beloved son of a, of a wealthy household, all the way to the lowest of depths. He's forced to work tending pigs, and his hunger is causing him to envy the swine and their slop. And finally, he comes to his senses. He finally realizes where he is and where he should be, and he decides, I'm going to return to my father. Now he's no longer expecting to be a son at this point. He realizes maybe that's something beyond what I can hope for, but he's, I'll take the role of a servant. Even they have food like I, I don't have now and shelter like I don't have now. That's who I'll be. It's no longer a home for me. It's simply a house. And so he sets out hoping for some tiny bit of grace. You've heard the story, and here's where it gets good. This is the best part of it. While the younger son is still a long ways off, while he'd been away, the father every day had been waiting, waiting, waiting. He had to have been waiting and watching in order to spot his returning son while he was still way down the road. He sees him, he, he, and instead of doing what we would do, which is stand in the doorway with our arms folded, with a scowl on our face going, hmm, let's see what he's got to say when he gets home. Waiting to see if the younger son really is repentant, whether he really has changed his ways. The father sets out at full tilt, out the door, hitches up his robes, runs down the road, embraces his son, Called, hey, get a robe, put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, get some sandals for his feet. Let's start the party. A great celebration, for this son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. This parable, the parable of the prodigal, it's one of the richest and most profound of the stories of Jesus. There is so much in this story. It's got a lot. But I want you to think today of just one aspect of the story. The Father's love. Think about what the Father feels towards his Son. The theologian Miroslav Volf in his book Exclusion and Embrace talks about this parable he talks about the way that the younger son wanted to unfather. It's a phrase that he uses, his father. He wanted to chuck the whole relationship, break it down, throw it in the trash, move on with his life as an independent agent with no ties and no responsibilities. But that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works at all. That relationship, it's still intact. Even with this great distance, it's still intact whether the son wants it or not. Because even though the son wants to unfather the father, the father never unsons the son. Even though the son rejects this relationship, says, I don't want it anymore, I want to go do my own thing, the father never does. The father stays put. And every day, he stands at the doorway of his house and he looks out down that road, hoping beyond hope to see his son come home. Every day, that father is completely aware, thinking to the depths of who he is about his lost son, knowing that wherever he is and whatever he is doing, he is still welcome at home. That is what the father knows, that the son is still loved. The father still loves, even when the son rejects that love. As you know, we've been taking some time to explore this idea of Christian spiritual formation. I know that's just a fancy label that we put on this process that we are in as the children of God, the transformational process of becoming like Christ. We know from Scripture that this is what we are called to. This is what God wants for us as the followers of Jesus, not just to make an affirmation, although those are important at times, 
Not simply to say the right words in the right way, but to give ourselves wholly and completely as living sacrifices, offering every part of who we are to Jesus so that the Spirit of God can come in and create within us the person that God wants us to be. Now, to give credit where credit is due, I've been using Dr. Diane Chandler's book on spiritual formation as a framework here. It's a guide to the process, simply because I haven't come across a better, more comprehensive explanation of this idea of Christian spiritual formation than hers. So you can imagine the model that she presents in her book in this way. There's a center, a core, okay, that's, that everything kind of radiates out from. The whole process flows out of this center. And she describes seven areas in which are aspects of our lives in which the Spirit of God wants to bring about transformation. We're going to go through each one of them. She's boiled it down to seven because she recognizes that those are universally applicable across cultures and across history. Most human creatures understand these seven characteristics. It's like the petals on a sunflower radiating out from the center. And then surrounding the whole of it, there is the, the application, the way we're meant to live into this transformed life in the world. It's a good model. I like it, and, and we'll be using it. But at this point in our conversation, we're still at the center. We're still at the core of the illustration. We haven't got out to the pedals yet. We will, let alone the application. It doesn't do for us to jump ahead on this, in this without getting this core nailed down, really understanding these core ideas. And so we need to talk about love. Last week we, we were discussing how we've been made in the image of God. The imago dei is that Latin phrase. Being made in the image of God, it, it carries some implications, right? If you have been made in the image of God, then it's going to mean something to how you live your life. First, it means that obviously we're connected to God. For sure, if, if we've been made by someone, we have a relationship already built in there. We've been created. We're not running around this world as like some kind of a cosmic accident with, without any kind of connections or, or responsibilities. We've got a role to play, a position to fill, a thing to do. And without unpacking all of the implications, we can accept that in terms of being formed spiritually, being made in the image of God means that we are in our best form, in the most uh, full, perfect form of what God intends, we are supposed to reflect that image of God. We are supposed to look like God, resemble of the Father, to be people in whom the likeness of God is readily evident. When people look at us, they see it. But it's just as true that that's not always the case. Instead of representing the image of God well, we often do it poorly. Primarily because we don't want to do it. We don't want to reflect the image of God. We'd much rather reflect our own image. And so, in light of that, God is left with something of a choice here. Because we are who we are, we are made in the image of God. We have this identity that we're meant to live into. And because that's how we're created... We just don't. We go our own way. We do our own thing. We take the inheritance that we've received, the very imago dei, the image of God in us, and we run off to that distant land and waste it in dissolute living. That's the way Luke puts it. And God has a choice. He could say, I'm done with it. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I could dust my hands and say they've made their choice. God could say that have nothing more to do with us. After all, it is not God that abandons us, it is us who abandon God. And so God could choose that, but God doesn't. I need that to sink in, into your hearts, into the very depth of who you are. God could choose to walk away from us. God would be justified in doing so, but God doesn't. Instead, God stands at that door of the house every day, looking off down the road, waiting and hoping that we will finally come to our senses and come home. See, God has never unsunned us or undaughtered us. 
even when we've tried to unfather him. Why? Because of love. A couple of weeks ago in our first message in this series, we talked about this, the fact that God desires this redemption. God wants to redeem us and transform us, and all of that desire and all of that transformation is rooted in God's love. This is why it's at the core of this diagram. Love is at the center of this whole process of becoming who God wants us to be. And I don't think I can overstate this. In fact, if anything, I understate it. This is a big thing, and there's no way that I can make a bigger deal out of it than is warranted. God's love is always going to be bigger than our imagination is capable of grasping. It is immense and eternal, God's love for us. Maybe it's so big that we lose sight of it at times. It's just all around us all the time, and we kind of forget. So the focus of the message today is to help you not forget. Remember this truth. Take this truth into your heart. The focus today is on God's love for us. It's eternal and unchanging. So I want to be sure that when you leave from here today, that you take that with you. That is the most precious thing that you can hold on to today, is how much God loves you. It's just a fact. It is, the way it is. John says it in this passage from 1 John 4. To know God is to know love. And to know love is to know God. God is love. Now, in the early church, back just after Jesus, when things were starting to get off and take off a little bit and they were starting to kind of get their heads around what it means to follow Jesus, there were two major theological figures, two guys that that stood head and shoulders above everybody else. It was Paul and it was John. We get most of what we understand about our faith and the character of God from these two, Paul and John. Matthew and Mark and Luke, they wrote things and they told stories and there's a lot for us to learn from them. I'm not dismissing them at all. Wonderful stuff. The other letter writers, they develop some rich theological ideas as well, and we benefit from their teaching. But it's Paul and John that really tell us the most about who God is and what Jesus has done and how the Spirit of God keeps working on us. And Paul taught us about grace, and John taught us about love. Now, we as brethren, we are in the Protestant tradition, that stream of Christian faith. We understand this idea of being formed by grace. This is what saves us. Martin Luther, that grumpy old monk from Wittenberg, he challenged this idea that somebody could somehow gain their salvation through human effort. He said, no, it doesn't work that way. Not the way that I read the Bible, if you can get there. Now, he's clearly responding to what he saw in his own day, in his own context, things that were going on in in that period. But what he did was that he reacquired and placed before the church again the teachings of Paul, particularly those in his letter to the Romans, those teachings that affirmed that salvation is what God does for us, not what we do for ourselves. Simple principle. For it is by grace that we are saved. This is not of our own doing. It is through faith. This is what Paul tells the Ephesians. And because Luther believed that the church had lost this understanding of salvation, he preached it, sola gratia, by grace alone. But you have to understand what grace is in order to understand how we are saved by grace. Grace is an unmerited gift. It's an undeserved gift gift a gift that is what grace means it's something that that is extended to the recipient not because they deserve it not because they're awesome but simply because the one giving it wants to give it think of your kids if you have kids right before their birthday when they're being a total jerk awful 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 and you've got this present 
And you're like thinking to yourself, boy, I don't know if I want to give it to them. They're being really nasty. As human parents, no, not you, me. I know I thought this way. That's not what grace is. Grace is, here's the gift, even though you don't deserve it. An unmerited gift. And so this, what is extended to us by God, it's not something we deserve. We get it because God wants to give it. Simple as that. And in response to those Judaizers who were trying to get Paul's churches to follow some laws in order to rightfully receive their salvation, that's a critical message to preach. They needed to hear that. That's why Paul wrote about it over and over again. You can't earn your salvation through being circumcised, Paul says. You can't earn it by keeping the law. You can't earn it by following the rules of the church either. It's simply a gift. We are saved by receiving a gift because God wants to give it. It's good stuff, right? It's pretty awesome. So that's Paul's contribution. Very important contribution. Truly earth-shaking. In response to this human tendency that we have to want to control our salvation, to wrestle it out of God's hands and put it in our own hands so that we have control, God says, nope. That's not the way it works. You can't do enough anyway. You're not good enough anyway. Your salvation has to be a gift from me to you because I want to do it. And it will always be that. By grace. But Luther, and a lot of us who have followed in his footsteps, he may have forgotten that other great early theologian, John. Because what John does is, John says, yeah, I, I, I get that. Grace stuff, I, I understand that. But what's behind the gift? What's motivating the grace? John asks the question, what in heaven's name would inspire this all-powerful, complete within himself, not needing anything kind of God, what would inspire him to offer this gift? What would lead Yahweh to want to extend grace to those that he's created. I mean, they don't deserve it. They've proven that over and over and over again. And God's not obligated in any way to, to offer grace. Humanity, in this constant tendency that they have towards being malformed, has run off into a distant land and wasted their birthright in dissolute living. So God owes us nothing. Nothing. So what? What would inspire God to stand in that doorway day after day waiting for the prodigal to return? Well, this is John's contribution. God does all that because of love. We're going to get deeper into the details of our response to God's love in the weeks to come. We will have one. We should have one. Like I mentioned today, though, the take-home is simply this. God is love. And God loves us. Please, get a hold of that. Get a hold of that. I want that to, to soak into the very depths of who you are today. This truth that, God, that John is telling us that love is from God, that God is love, and that God shows his love by sending Jesus into the world. God loves us even though we don't love God. See, God's love is not conditional or dependent on our love in any way. So think about this. Think about this, people. You are loved. You are loved. Each and every individual in this room is loved. Powerfully loved. Loved by the eternal creator of the universe. Loved by the maker of heaven and earth. Loved. God loves you. Oh man, God loves you so much that he put his own image in you said, I want you, because I love you, I want you to show a little reflection of who I am. 
I didn't do that for anybody else, God said. I didn't do that for, for cattle or sheep or goats or trees or beetles or anybody. I like them. I love them. They're good. But I love you in a special way. I love you. You are so valuable to God. You are so valuable to God, so precious to God. You are not junk. You are not garbage. You are not worthless. You are loved. You think about what the world is telling us. You think about what our culture tells us over and over and over again. You are garbage. Unless you do something that benefits me, I don't have any use for you. That's what the world's telling us. But no matter what the world says, you are still loved by God. Oh, man. Oh, that's so cool. I get excited about this. We talked about this. We're always being formed. There's always something shaping us. There's always something pressing us. We are squishy like Play-Doh. We take the shape of the things that press upon us. And the world is going to try to malform you. It's going to try to twist you and contort you into a mold that it recognizes. And the world is going to say this kind of stuff. It's going to say, you know what? You're not loved. You're not worthy of love. You have to earn people's love. You have to do things so that they will think highly of you. The world is going to tell you that you're meaningless junk unless you somehow can trick people into loving you with filters on Snapchat or Instagram or whatever. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. Somehow you're going to have to do something to fool people into loving you because you're just not worth anything on your own. That's malformed. That's twisted and corrupted. That is not the way that God sees us. What God wants to form in us with this eternal love that he has for us, that's ours, regardless of what we've done. Regardless of how we're being malformed by the world. Like that father waiting for their son to return in Jesus' story, God never stops loving us. So we're going to be formed... So do we want to be formed by those lies that the world is telling us or do we want to be formed by God's love? So this is the central message for today that God loves us and God has this rich and wonderful desire that we would be formed in that love, that we would be formed into the likeness of Christ. God's love is... That is the content and the power behind our our formation into Christ-likeness. Christ perfectly lived (laughs) the Father. He lived in the Father's love because he was perfectly obedient to the Father. And the Father's love was made perfectly visible in him. If you want to know what this looks like, to be loved and to respond appropriately to that love, just look at Jesus. That's it. Simple as that. This is what we're supposed to do. So if that's what you take home today, that you are loved, and that Jesus shows us what it means to be a loved person, a loved loved child of God, that's that's enough. But since we always do like a little practical application, I'm going to try to offer you some, some of that today too. Just one thing. So we know these things are true. We've established these things. God has made us, right? Get some head nods here for that one. God has made us, okay? We didn't just show up. We're not just random chance. God has made us. And, believe the scripture, we know that God has made us special. There's something unique about humanity that, that the rest of creation doesn't have, that we have the image of God in us. Whatever that means, we have it. But we also know this to be true, that the image of God can be obscured within us by our own selfish pride. We can take that, that wonderful glowing image of God and, and put a bunch of muck on top of it and obscure it and hide it through our own selfishness. Like the prodigal in the story. Perfect example of this. We've, we've insulted God and we've run off with our inheritance. <laughs> we've tried to sever that relationship with God between God and us. We've tried to unfather the Father. But God has not let us loose. So glorious. 
God has not turned loose of us. God has not let us go off on our own. God still considers us his children, his precious creation. God has never stopped loving us even when we decided not to love God. And so God has made this way for us. The road is there. It's easy enough for us to do if we'll just come to our senses and come home. Again, think, think about the story the prodigal, he's returning, he's, he's still way, way down the road and the father sees him coming. There's a tiny, tiny little figure way, way off on the, on the horizon, but he recognizes him. The father recognizes his son even at that great distance because the father never forgets what the son looks like. The father knows his son, who the son is supposed to be and sees him coming and he doesn't wait there with his arms folded with a scowl on his face he runs out to meet him to embrace him and the tears of joy are flowing and the laughter and the robe and the ring and the sandals and the welcome back into the home what a gift what a grace no, it is a gift. It is grace because the son doesn't deserve this. The son has done nothing to merit this. The prodigal does not, does not earn this in any way. I mean, he's thrown it all away. He's rejected his family, his father, and all that he can rightfully hope for is to take up the role of a servant in his father's house, crossing his fingers, hoping maybe, maybe I can take that place. But the father says, no, no, my boy, no. You're my son, my son. And he offers him full reinstatement as a son. Not because he merits it, not because he deserves it, because it is a gift of grace. So the son is saved by grace. Paul's right. But John is also right. Because John reminds us what's behind that grace, what is driving that grace. The Father doesn't offer grace out of some obligation or social convention. In fact, he does the opposite. Social convention in this case would have said, don't bring him back into the house. He's a dingbat. He doesn't deserve it. That would have been social convention. But the Father offers grace to his son because he loves his son. It's love that motivates the father, father. love that, that compels him to forget about all that stuff that the son had done to insult him and reject him. The grace is in the giving, but the love is the content of the gift. Love is what makes the father give the grace in the first place. And each one of us has that same gift. Pray that you've all received it. But if you haven't, it's still being offered. It's still there, that gift. And if we've been the recipients of such love, such coming as an unmerited gift, then what do we do with it? Here's the application. What do we do with this? A simple step. Not the only step, to be sure, but a simple one in this process of spiritual transformation is to simply be like the Father. Show a little family resemblance here. We've already witnessed what God does. We've already seen the way the God is, standing and waiting for us to come home, ready to run out and embrace us in such wonderful love and bring us back into the family. Well, be like that. Be like that. If God loves us so much that he would offer this gracious gift of his love to people that don't even deserve it, would it be too much to ask for us to be gracious in the same way? Perhaps we can be kind. We can be gracious to our sisters and brothers like John tells us to in that letter. You know there's two sons in the story, right? There's a son that is not like his father, does not embrace the prodigal, does not celebrate his return. This is the reason that love, God's love for us and our love for each other, this is the reason that it is right at the heart of us being who we're meant to be. 
transformed into the image of Christ. This is at the core of any kind of Christian spiritual formation. John says it. <laughs> read that letter. It's wonderful stuff. You can read the Gospel of John too. That's fine. That's, that's good as well. There's a lot of love in that one. But John says this, even though we have never seen God, if we love each other, then God abides in us. If we can be gracious towards each other, then God abides in us. And that love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Lord, I'd ask for each one here today a special gift, a grace. I ask that each heart and each mind and each being, each soul would feel in a deep, perhaps new way, how much they are loved. Help us to know that we are your beloved, that we are precious and special. Lord, we know that none of this is of our own doing. It comes from you. It is a gift, a grace that you create in us and make us who we are through your great love. Lord, we live in a world in which we are tempted away from that love. We lose sight of it. We start to think of life in transactional terms. And we lose our understanding of grace. So today, Lord, I ask that you would pour out on each spirit here a deeper understanding of how beloved they are. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. stand. We want to praise you. We want to love you. We want to serve you. We know we can do none of these things without your love for us. So we pray that we would live in that love so that we might go from this place to praise, 
to love, and to serve. We ask a blessing on each one here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may go in peace.